So, I'm Nick. Um, when we first started going around, uh, you know, we only had one person who was interested in graph kill. I was like, good, I'm only going to let down one person tonight. Then we got to the back. And apparently that's where everyone who wants to know about graph is. So I'm like, great, we're going to let down a lot of people. Um, yeah. So uh, this is just going to be kind of a basic talk of GraphQL and just how to get it into Rails uh, and some of like the reasons to choose it over REST or integrate it with REST because it can sit alongside in Ruby. Um, so some information on GraphQL and why to use it. First off, it's easy to pick up and easy to read uh, with it being a very um, syntax-based language, query language, it's kind of easy to see what's going on instead of reading through a bunch of route files and figuring out what's going on there. You get to query your data, get back exactly what you need, and it's easy to extend. And the graph at the bottom is um, just Google Trends um, of how GraphQL is slowly growing. But before we start, what's wrong with REST? <laughs> Nothing. So we'll put our pitchforks down. REST still exists and has good places to be. Um, so some information on REST and the difference between those. Uh, REST is an architectural concept for network-based communications. There's no official set of tools. Um, it doesn't really care if you're using HTTP, AMQP, or anything else. Um, it is designed to decouple the API from the client and focus on making APIs last for decades instead of optimizing for performance, which is typically important for our mobile clients. Um, one of the main uh, tenets of REST is to utilize, a, uh, utilize the uniform interface of the protocols that exist in. Um, so in HTTP, you get to leverage uh, stuff like hypermedia controls. Uh, as well as caching um, and status codes. Uh, and one of the main focus of REST is hypermedia controls. Uh, and there's some argument there that if you're not really using hypermedia controls, GraphQL could be a good solution um, for yours. So compared, GraphQL is a query language specification and a collection of tools uh, to make everything more uniform. It uh, invents its own con conventions, and again, if you're not using hypermedia controls, uh, GraphQL could be more relevant. So who's currently using GraphQL? Um, GitHub's uh, version 4 of their API rolled out under GraphQL. Facebook, of course, is the one who originally created it. Uh, Shopify is a very big user of it, and some other uh, large names for currently using it for their mobile API. So we're going to take a quick look a kind of a mobile uh, or a newer UI that uh, could benefit from it. So uh, this is just a React app with a bunch of components. Um, and we'll look at what kind of data is needed for that. So we first need our location to drop down. So we need to first hit the server and see uh, what locations we need. From there, we need to pull down daily summaries for today, yesterday, and tomorrow. Uh, we have our weekly status for this week, last week, and next week. We need to hit uh, server get alerts as well as an extended forecast. So in all, we have about uh, five different types of data we need. Uh, if we were to do this in a very component, you know, uh, React-friendly structure, we'd be looking about eight different API calls um, just to get the individual things, which leads us in total to one plus eight times n, where n is the uh, number of locations we need that one for our initial network call. And of course, you're probably thinking, that's a lot of data. But the more eagle mind among you may say, well, we'll just custom endpointify it. And we'll just do a quick all the weather and location data in one call, and it's beautiful. Except for then we get into the issue of, well, what if we just want the location data? Or if we want a seven-day forecast, or no history, or just all of the things. 
And we get back into our initial issue of endpoint help. So we can try and graph Qify this. With that, we have a nice little query where we pass in our location of what we want. We tell it we want uh, a daily call with today's date. We would like the score, the condition, and the chance of rain back. We also have a uh, weekly object, which we'll give it this week, and we'll, of course, create three of those. We just want the weekly scores. We're going to ask for the alerts. And we're going to ask for the forecast. In this case, we're going to actually ask for um, a 10-day forecast, which gives us one nice call. So in this case, we only have to do one for the network locations, and then from there, uh, for each one we need, so we have success. So this is straight from GraphQL site. We uh, just describe on the server what kind of data we are going to provide. On our call side, we just ask for the data we want, and we get predictable results every time. Uh, one of the big points of why Facebook did this was as their mobile app kept growing, uh, the network calls just kept growing. And then in a lot of cases, uh, and I'm sure guys with production uh, REST APIs know, you are just throwing back a ton of data that's probably not relevant to the UI, but otherwise you have to create a whole new endpoint just to hand back that data. Um, so what's some of the reasons why we probably want to avoid GraphQL? Well, one of the big reasons is it doesn't play nice with the web. It treats HTTP as a dump pipe and just throws everything through post requests and uh, doesn't play nice with any you know normal conventions that we're used to. Uh, as well as without custom implementations, uh, a caching layer will be too specific and mostly useless. So. Taking a quick look of how to add GraphQL to Rails, we're going to take a look at an existing project, one that a lot of people are probably familiar with if you've ever been through Michael Harding's Rails tutorial. Just the uh, quick Twitter project that he has you run through and um, how to get some data from that. So it's as easy as just adding the gem GraphQL and running a generate command for GraphQL install. Uh, from there, we're going to create just a user endpoint to pull back our users. Uh, and we will do that with a generation of a user object. So for this, um, we just uh, create a, um, I'm blanking on it now because I'm nervous. Create some code. <laughs> yeah, so we're just going to define a uh, GraphQL object. Inside there, uh, we define, uh, we give it a name of user. We can give it a description, and I'm being lazy and just calling it a user. Uh, and then we get to define what field we want to make available. So in this case, we're only going to make ID, name, and email. Stuff like password digest, we're not going to allow that to be passed through, so we're just, we're not going to include it. As well as we give them the types they should be expecting. We also do uh, nested fields. In this case, we get followers, which is a uh, user type. And then we can pass in arguments. So we, we define that we would like an argument of size so we can limit how many users we're getting back at any one time. And we do the exact same thing with following, uh, except for this time, we're actually calling user.following.limit and pulling that in. Uh, next thing you want to do is build out your query uh, schema. And uh, this is just the root schema where you're going to throw in all the different types of objects you're trying to make available in your API. So in this case, we're just making user available with a user type, which we defined before. And we're giving it an optional ID of uh, well, the user ID, which is going to uh, go out, find the user, and uh, allow the query to operate. And we're going to hook that uh, query data type into our main root GraphQL schema, which is nicely generated by uh, that generation command, which uh, we just do a query and a query type. This is also, uh, so this, I'm mainly going over how you pull data down. If you're going to mutate data or uh, change it, then you also would put in your mutation type uh, right under there as well. Uh, so building out a controller, this is uh, one of the nicely generated controllers from GraphQL for you. 
Um, if you need any kind of contextual things, if you want it to pull in the current user, anything like that, this is where you throw that in at. Uh, and otherwise, this is just gonna be the main entry point for all of your GraphQL um, commands. And then they even generate some nice code to deal with uh, what happens if someone sends a malformed result. Um, again, this is all boilerplate from their, uh, their gem. Finally, you just add it to routes. As I said, one of the bad things about GraphQL is it is just a dump pipe. You just set up a post, uh, set an endpoint where you want it to go and point it to the GraphQL execute. Um, and from there, it uh, knows how to hit. So running a query. Uh, the queries are very simple. In this case, we're just going to say we want a user with the ID of 1, because uh, there's a lot of users on my awesome Twitter. Uh, we're going to ask for the name, email, and we just want the follower's email. We don't really care about the names or anything like that. Um, and then it'll send back a nice predictable result again with uh, our user, email, and then all of the emails of the followers. So, nervous, so I ramble a lot. Um, and you're probably like, this is a lot of information to take in. And he's kind of going just through it. <laughs> if you. Uh, Want to find out more about it? Uh, GraphQL Ruby uh, org is uh, the main site for the Ruby gem, but all the schema and everything is defined at GraphQL org. Uh, again, one of the main points to use GraphQL is uh, it's one endpoint to access all of your data. Uh, you get to retrieve your data um, as your client needs. So you know, as if anyone's gone through and made mobile apps or web apps, you'll know that you don't necessarily need the same data on mobile and you know data is precious on mobile especially if you're trying to get into the emerging markets where they pay for everything they download um, there's no need to uh, tailor endpoints to your views and uh, one of the big things they push is that there's no versioning you can depreciate through code anything that you need uh, and then because everyone's defining the queries that they need um, you don't have to worry about if you add something in, what that's going to return, if that's going to then expose some kind of business logic you don't want a certain client to have. Um, and it just it makes that a little bit easier. So I'd like to thank you guys. Again, I'm Nick, uh, developer over at Cluster Truck. You can find me on the interwebs at those places. So thanks. Yeah? Take a can't, can't promise anything, but yeah. What are ADOs? Hey, Nick. So, uh, got a question up here. Sorry. Oh, did you have one? I asked if you wanted a question, and then I asked a slightly question. What are ADOs? ADOs, ADOs. They're like Herculos. Yeah. So, yeah, so that is a. Uh, it's something I haven't played with much because uh, a lot of REST clients don't actually use it. Uh, but essentially what it does is it's like contextually aware linking. So when you return the results, you also return back links that are contextual to that results. One of the typical um, one of the typical examples is a bank account. And uh, if you do just a temp or a typical like account balance call to get an account balance, it will return the expected results, but then it will also return some linking to maybe withdraw, deposit, um, you know, any of those other things. But if you make the call again later on, and let's say you're overdrawn, well, there's not going to be a withdrawal option. Now it's just going to return links for depositing, because it's the only thing that's really allowed at that point for you. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's more just kind of like for bots to kind of work their way through a little bit easier. Right. So that's, that's something that I've yet to actually really run into in the wild. So yeah. Yes, uh, and that's, you know, mine's a very basic example, so it doesn't really have any of that, but um, in the main schema, you can actually start pulling in um, permissions in there. 
as well as setting stuff like current users. And uh, I haven't really experimented to see what kind of work it does with Pundit. I really am hoping that there's something there. But um, yeah, in my basic example, it was just a query what I can. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can make things a little bit safer than what's on. Yeah, and it is a good note. I mean, this was designed by Facebook to keep their mobile, to pass all their data through their mobile app. So again, for Rails, there's surely something because they did build out all their tools. But um, yeah, there, I mean, there's some security built in on server side. <laughs> No, no, this is something uh, I was playing with. Actually, I had this talk prepared before I even got hired. So, <laughs> yeah. I think this may be kind of feedback on what you were saying, but um, as far as our authentication goes, is that all just done like with a standard header? Like when in the post request, do you know much about authenticating your calls? Um, yeah, I, would, I, 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 I haven't really gone too far into it. Uh, but yeah, it, it is. Um, because it does just kind of piggyback on top of a REST call at the end of the day, uh, you could pass through an authorization um, in the header. Uh, I mean, that, that would be how you would get it contextually aware to the current user anyways inside of Rails, just the way Rails handles things. It's, it's still a controller endpoint, so you could probably put a required user in front of it and, or something like that. And then before it even gets to that, it's still yeah. like you've already written JSON and said go away. Yeah. How, how does this handle like the database query into things to actually pull in all that data? Is it just calling a method and then so you're trading in plus eight or whatever rest calls versus in plus 20 SQL? Right. Uh, so inside the, I don't know if I can get. Yeah, so inside our user, um, it does just tie into the base user model. Um, so from there, it, you know, you could, it essentially just calls anything that you have based into your main yeah, user. Yeah, right. Yeah, so you, you can make it more database efficient. <laughs> I'm sorry? Like, oh, so like sending it out instead of actually getting yeah. it in? That's actually a good question. I honestly don't know. I haven't looked into actually tying into third party ones. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Not sure. <laughs> Um, honestly, for me, it's a lot of flexibility. I am trying to move more into iOS, so I really I like dealing with like the what you know what a mobile app has to deal with, and um, you know for what I see, I I don't I'm not the biggest fan of REST endpoints because especially if you get into like React front end, you have to start you know either you're customizing things or you're just hitting just tons of calls, which. You know, for us, it isn't a big deal, but as more and more emerging markets get online, it's something that we do have to start thinking about if we're going to have a global reach in our uh, companies. Yeah. Is there a way to have fields available just depending on different roles of the user requesting it? So, like, if you're an admin user, your API request, like your GraphQL request, you have available all these fields. If you're a non-login user, you only get this limited subset of 
Yeah, and you can, um, they, they, they do have great documentation on it, but once you get into your context, you can actually start adding in more of like, you know, based on, um, based on current users and stuff like that, you know, we, we want to start changing up some permissions and um, what we can't have available. Yeah? What, what kind of tools are out there? It seems like if you're defining a schema, there should be some way to, that was coming from the common law, almost kind of reminds me like a visible, like, like old school soap stuff where you could hit an endpoint and get all of the, what's possible. Are there tools out there where you can hit an endpoint and just return the schema so you know what kind of stuff? Um, so I know there are some gems from the server side if you just want to dump everything available out there. Um, I'm not sure as in like if I could have a tool that just hits like GitHub's and recreates the documentation. Uh, I know that was one of the big selling points of GraphQL from the server side. You can auto generate documentation, um, but I don't know from like you hitting someone else's servers, sure. what you can do. Yeah, like I said, I know it's not the same, and thank God it's not. Like, yeah. In, like the soap days, you could, you could hit with your ID, you could get a, a file that would expose all the objects and stuff. Yeah. I think you can build your own query to do that, right? What's that? You can build your own query to do that. Like, yeah, you can get your right yeah. Oh, man. Cool. Well. Now, now I'm seeing so many, like, soap parallels in this. <laughs> 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 so those companies that you mentioned earlier that you had, you had those yeah. there, uh, they have are those companies with that are just using it or companies with public GraphQL uh, GitHub version four is the public GraphQL. Um, yeah, I mean other ones like Credit Karma. I'm, I don't know if they have a public <laughs> Yeah, I hope they don't. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but yeah, I, I know that was that was part of some of the spike that happened in that graph was uh, when uh, GitHub announced version four of their API. They announced they were going to just move forward with GraphQL, and um, that got a lot of people starting to talk about it. The dip was credit karma. Now. Probably, <laughs> yeah. Either that or Intuit, one of the two. Cool. Have you tried? No, I, I've looked at it, but I just, I don't know. I'm not creative enough to come up with things. <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> this man has like a three hour round trip drive every day. <laughs> that is affecting his uh, time, right? Yeah, yeah, from Bloomington. So hopefully I'll be ending end of September. Thanks, fingers crossed. <laughs> so cool. More qu I, you don't have to stop asking questions just because I stood up for the record. Not that you were going to anyway, but just wanted to be clear. Cool. Well, thanks, everyone.